Is wildfire no longer a problem in California? This is the question somebody asked me today. When I was having a conversation with them, I was telling them that I'm a weatherman and I'm mostly interested in wildfire. And they asked that question. They said, yeah, seems like wildfire hasn't really been a problem the last couple of years. I haven't really heard anything of this about it this year. So they wondered if the problem is solved. And at first, I, I kind of understand what he what he's saying because normally at this point in the year we've burned 1.5 million acres and this year we've only burned about 300,000 and a lot of that acreage burned has been in either far northern California or in the desert so in areas that aren't very pop populated and yeah there just hasn't been a whole lot this year and I believe last year was actually a pretty quiet year as well. Now a big part of the reason for that is because we picked up so much rain this last winter. And that was something that I brought up when this question was asked. So I said, well, a big part of the reason that we haven't had much wildfire activity this year is because we picked up so much rain this winter. A lot of, or this last winter, we're almost into the next winter. So a lot of California picked up two to three times as much rain as a normal year. And then we just had a series of storms that continued to bring some rainfall to California. There was some even in spring. And then in summer, we had some thunderstorm activity, which usually doesn't bring a lot of rain, but certainly returned some moisture to the ground. Then we even had a tropical storm, Hillary, come in through Southern California and drop multiple inches of rain during that event, which certainly brought some moisture back into our fuels. And then to further explain that, I said, well, that makes a lot of sense that if you have more moisture in your fuels, you're going to have less wildfire activity. Just like if you've ever done a campfire. If you're starting your campfire with your moist log versus your dry log, it's much easier to start the fire with the dry log and then it's gonna burn a lot hotter and faster. So this year, we had that moist log. Interestingly though, when I said this, their response was perfect because it is exactly right. So the next question he asked was, oh, well, if we picked up so much rain, and that's the reason this wildfire season wasn't that bad, doesn't that just mean we have a bunch more fuels now though, and then future wildfire seasons are going to be bad? And that is exactly the correct question to be asking. So because we picked up a lot of rain this last winter, this fire season, I mean, the fire season is not officially over, but it's up to this point, we have not burned many acres. However, because of all the rain we picked up, we did have a lot more fuels grow. And then right now it is an El Nino year, so we may have another rainy winter. Usually El Nino does lead to above average precipitation parts of California. So it may be another rainy winter this over the next few months. And it certainly seems like we're off to a rainy start given this fall. And I think there's been maybe five or six systems that have already brought some rain to Northern California. But it is California. So eventually we are going to dry out. That's just how it works here. We usually have very rainy years and then we have very dry years. And then even in the rainy years, it'll maybe, most of the rainfall only comes from a few storms. That's just the nature of California. So eventually we're going to dry back out. And then all of those fuels that have been able to grow with all of the rainfall are going to dry out. And then we're going to have more fuel than ever for wildfire, which could lead to more extreme wildfire. So while things may be good in the short run, it may just be setting us up for more danger in the long run. So that's, I would say, the initial answer to is wildfire no longer a problem in California. It may not be as big of a problem right now, but it's certainly still going to be... I, I don't even know if you want to view it as a problem. That's how I've always come across this topic is wildfires become a problem in California and what is the solution? But the more I've been reading Fire in California's ecosystems, the more it keeps putting forward the point that wildfire is not necessarily a problem in California, or a part, it's not a problem for the California ecosystem. Wildfire is the California ecosystem. Just like we have 
temperature and rainfall and relative humidity, California also has wildfires, something that's just built into our landscape because we have a Mediterranean climate. We have wet winters, dry summers, meaning the hottest part of the year is also the driest part of the year, which means you're most likely going to have some wildfire activity. And because of that, a lot of our plants and even some of our animals have evolved with fire in California. So just the same as a redwood tree likes to be by the coast because it can absorb fog through its needles, because so fog is part of its environment, it also has fireproof bark because fire is also part of its environment. And there you might be thinking, well, maybe the redwood tree just views fire as a problem, and then that's its defense against it. But a lot of species in California, like, I, I'm not exactly sure if redwood trees do this, but I know giant sequoias do, so I'd imagine redwood trees do. I'm pretty sure pines do. I know chamise in the chaparral does. But they have seeds that germinate specifically after fire because it clears out the competition, and then those seeds are just primed to be able to sprout and hopefully make it to adulthood because they're sprouting at a time when there's not as much competition for nutrients in the soil or light because there's less shading if a fire has just come through and taken out the plants that would have been absorbing that light. So those plants certainly don't view wildfire as a problem. Those plants use, use fire to their advantage. It's actually, fire almost is the solution in a weird way for them. So that's something that I've been slowly figuring out over the last maybe six months to the last year because at first my, my view was, okay, wildfires become a problem in California. And to a certain extent, you could still say that because we don't exactly want extreme wildfire that threatens life and property. That certainly does seem like a problem, and that is something that can be solved. So maybe the correct way to phrase that question is maybe just with a bit more nuance. So maybe wildfire has never been a problem for, Cal for California, but maybe extreme wildfire promoted by fuel accumulation and people moving into the wildland urban interface is a problem because it overwhelms our ability to suppress the fire and protect life and property. That, I'd say, can safely be viewed as a problem. So then the question would be, okay, what do we do about that? Number of things we can do about that, including creating defensible space around our homes, creating fuel breaks around our communities, and actually, once again, using fire to our advantage. And that may actually be the best way to solve that problem is you can put fire on the ground, clear out a lot of the fuels, maybe around the community, create almost like a moat, how a moat protects a castle. You could clear out a lot of the fuels around a community that's in the wildland urban interface. So a fire can't start in the forest and then just wipe out the town as it goes through it. If you have a fuel break, the fire, unless it has crazy spot fires that can go maybe miles, which does occasionally happen, if you have a fuel break, it usually does a pretty good job of stopping that fire because the fire needs fuel in order to continue to burn. It needs heat, oxygen, and fuel. So if you take out part of that fire triangle, then the fire is not going to be able to just move through an area that has no fuel whatsoever. Obviously, unless it's a spot fire that just jumps over it, but... Not, not much you can do there. So there are some solutions in that aspect, but then uh, there is a bit more nuance added to my opinion because my original thought was, all right, prescribed fire is the answer. The reason we have these extreme wildfires that create so much threat to life and property is because we've been suppressing fire so much in the past because we view fire as the enemy, as... We have a war against fire. We put out fire as quickly as possible. And then because that's a natural part of the California ecosystem and the fire is supposed to be clearing out fuels, when we put it out as fast as possible, those fuels then accumulate. And with more fuel, you then increase your potential for an extreme wildfire down the road. So when I was first thinking about this, I was thinking, 
Oh, easy solution. The problem is fuel accumulation and the fact that things are getting hotter and drier, which is making those fuels even drier and more likely to lead to an extreme wildfire. So then the easiest solution would be to, instead of suppress fire, we actually put more fire on the ground. Now, obviously not during conditions when it's going to get out of control and take out communities, but in a controlled manner where we can clear out the fuels, and that seems like a pretty good solution. Then I learned that, again, the, the simple solutions usually aren't correct for everyone. And if you create a generalization, you're going to be missing some aspects and you may actually end up hurting the environment that you hope to help. That was something I learned maybe six months ago when I was reading a book about the chaparral and it was talking about how you have different fire regimes. So up in the Sierra where that environment evolved with fire happening maybe every five to 15 years because you have a lot of lightning strikes up there, the plants have evolved for frequent fire. So in those places, you probably do want to be doing a lot of prescribed burning, clear out some of that undergrowth so that it doesn't accumulate too much because if it accumulates too much, then the fire can become so extreme that it overwhelms, for example, a giant sequoia's natural defenses and a tree that would have been fine with fire in the past is then destroyed. So that's an example of where you would want a lot of prescribed fire in a place where the natural environment is used to a lot of fire, but in the chaparral, which you usually find in places like the Central Coast or Southern California, that's not the correct solution because in those areas, lightning is not as frequent. So in the natural ecosystem, you might only have fires coming through there every 30 to 50 years. So those plants have evolved for fire to happen every 30 to 50 years. So if we were then to start putting fire on the ground every 5 to 15 years, just thinking, oh, it's a one solution for everyone, so what's true for the Sierra is also true for the chaparral, we would end up wiping out the entire chaparral ecosystem, which is home to a lot of California native plants, and countless animals depend on the chaparral for their existence. So we would not only create the extinction of mo most likely a lot of plants, but maybe even some animals out there as well all in the hopes of trying to make things better. Thinking, okay, extreme wildfire is the problem. It's a problem because of fuel accumulation. That happened because of fire suppression, so what we need to do is put more fire on the ground. But there's nuance to the solutions. So what's true for the Sierras, not true for the Chaparral. So the main point that I'm trying to put forward there is that it's a lot more complex than maybe we all originally had hoped. I, I, I can say this because I have felt this myself, where I'd, I want there to just be a simple solution because it's a lot easier to put forward a simple solution. It's much more difficult to make a very nuanced case for the best step forward. And you, you see this in all kinds of walks of life. You can see it in politics as well. Just a simple simple catchphrase or a simple solution is maybe going to rally up the crowd a bit more than someone who dives into all the different uh, trade-offs that you could have given different policies that could be affected. Something like that. So I had already started to learn that it's not just more fire means less extreme fire that it's different for different, what you call different fire regimes. But then as I've continued to read this book, Fire in California's Ecosystems, this last chapter especially made the problem even more complicated. So in the past, I was really just thinking about how do we reduce extreme wildfire? And what do we need to do in order to reduce extreme wildfire? But the problem there is I was only looking at things from a wildfire perspective and I wasn't as much looking at things from the whole ecosystem perspective. I guess you could say I was when I started to think about the chaparral and if we just did a bunch of prescribed fire, we'd wipe out the chaparral. That's getting a little bit closer towards the truth. 
So what this last chapter was talking about in Fire in California's Ecosystems is chapter 7. It's talking about the interactions of fire with soil, water, and air. Now I'm not going to go into all the details again. If you want the details, you can watch the videos that I did this last week. But quick summary is after a wildfire, your soils will typically become a bit more water repellent and it's harder for water to infiltrate into the soils. Because of that, you end up with more water after maybe a storm just turning into runoff or what you call overland flow. And that's going to increase erosion because instead of the water just nicely soaking into your soils, more of it's just going to turn into runoff. It's going to carry some of the soil, some of the rocks with it. That leads to what you call hill slope erosion. Then at the same time, you since you have more water on your hillsides, less being in less infiltrating your soils, that water then goes into your streams and it leads to more stream flow. Now, with more stream flow, that's going to lead to more channel erosion as well. And then, so that's looking at the interactions with soil, some of the interactions with your hillsides, with your water. The water itself in that stream is most likely going to be a bit murkier, a bit muddier, because it's going to have all that sediment in it. Now, that could be a good thing if it's bringing some much-needed nutrients to other areas, but obviously it's pulling the nutrients out of one area. Then you also have the interactions of fire and air. And this is maybe the one that people think about the most because it's actually the one that impacts the largest amount of people. Where there's, it's, you can't just say, oh, simple solution, let's put a bunch of fire on the ground and clear out the fuels. Because wildfire, as we all know, creates smoke. And smoke has a lot of pollutants in it. Things like carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, which can lead to more climate change. It has methane, which has a similar effect. It has nitrogen oxides, VOCs, particulate matter, all kinds of stuff that you don't exactly want to be breathing in. And that can have negative impacts on human health. So what I've talked about so far is that it's not just a wildfire problem any solutions that we have are also going to affect the soils, which are going to affect the plant communities there. It's going to affect the streams, which streams and hillsides, which is going to lead to more erosion if there's more fire. And then obviously erosion or increased flooding has its negative impacts. And then you also have the whole air quality aspect as well. So that complicates things even more. Now, instead of just looking at things on a wildfire perspective, we're looking at the entire ecosystem and once you look at it that way i i forget where i'm getting this quote from but the 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 exact quote goes along the lines of there are no solutions only trade-offs so maybe we decide that the impacts to erosion and flooding would be too large if we put fire on the ground so we allowed the fuels to accumulate but then we drastically increase the chance of an extreme wildfire happening. And then that can have its dangers. So then maybe we say, okay, let's actually do the wildfire. Let's clear out the fuels. But then obviously we end up having more erosion and then you end up having worse air quality. So then you have negative impacts there. So then it's all just about deciding what is the correct balance? What's the correct thing to do right now? I have my own opinions based on what I've been reading in this textbook so far. It seems like the correct way to go about this is to try to, I'd say, get our directions from nature and to try to fit ourselves in with nature as well as we possibly can. So what I mean by that is tying it back into what I talked about with the fire regimes, where natural localized spots in California have a natural cycle that they have with fire. So some plant communities might like fire every 50 years, some plant communities might like fire every five years. So if we're thinking about how we should interact with fire and how we should use fire on the landscape, the easiest thing to do would most likely be to just try to mimic what the landscape already likes. 
because that's most like that's going to be most in tune with the balance of nature and obviously there's still going to be some negative trade-offs there but it's at least as close to living in balance with nature as possible which is going to be what's best for all the plant communities and then what's good for the plants is also going to be what's good for the animals and then we also have to include ourselves in that picture so obviously we have to do what's right for humans as well that keeps our life and property safe so the correct i'd say answer there is just to be viewing this at a, as localized a scale as possible and understanding that the situation is very complex which means our solutions are not exactly solutions they're more trade-offs and those trade-offs are going to be very complex and right there you might be thinking okay so what am i supposed to do about this because the average person including myself doesn't know the exact amount of prescribed burning we should do in what areas and how to mimic a natural fire regime that all sounds very difficult but that's why i think there's we're lucky that we have people who do this professionally so i think maybe what we can do on a local scale or an individual scale is just trust the professionals that they know what they're doing and then if they do a prescribed fire hopefully we ask some questions to make sure it's good but to understand that oh the air quality is bad right now because they understand that if they continue to allow those fuels to grow that there's just going to be a larger wildfire in the future which is also going to lead to bad air quality but it could also put a bunch of lives at risk and maybe the fuels in that area have been burning for or haven't burned in far too long of a time and we actually need some fire back on the ground to restore the ecosystem to its natural balance maybe because we've tilted it out of balance because of all of our fire suppression in the past so that's one side of it but then there are also things we can do individually that seem to be true across the board no matter where you're living and that's things like creating a defensible space around your home I've heard this from firefighters where they say when they go into an area and they're trying to protect a community it makes their job a lot harder and a lot more dangerous if there's some home that is has no defensible space and it's basically just a tinder box and if they were to try to defend that they'd be putting their lives at risk and I've even heard some cases where they'll look at a house and they say you know what the owner the owner of that house obviously doesn't care whether it burns down so why should we care and then they go to the house that maybe does have a bit more defensible space because they think you know we actually have a lot better chance of saving this one and it's we're going to be a lot safer if we try to save this one than the other one which is not in good shape so creating a defensible space that's very important creating a good evacuation plan as a community is also very important there's things like firewise and all kinds of different organizations you can just reach out to cal fire to see kind of how you can get involved what you can do and i think those are some of the simplest steps that if every person in california did that we would drastically reduce the nuanced problem that i talked about where extreme wildfire putting life and property in danger does seem to have become a problem in California. If we in each individually just did our part to around our own homes and then maybe once we got our own house in order, we maybe reached out to community members, tried to maybe share some of the knowledge that we had about defensible space, about good evacuation plans and then you got your street in order and then maybe your entire city and then if each city did that in California then we would put a massive dent in what has become a problem which is wildfire getting out of control and it may not seem that way just because the last 2 years have been so minimal in terms of extreme wildfire but it is California and eventually we're going to dry out again and wildfire 
is a part of our natural environment. So it's here to stay. We just need to learn how to, I would say, not only live with it, but maybe even use it to our advantage. So I've already talked a lot about that with things like prescribed burning, but if we were all individually to create that great defensible space around our homes, if we had good evacuation plans in place and everyone knew what they're supposed to do so that if you had to evacuate, you knew your house was going to be safe to as, as well as as safe as it could be. <laughs> and then you knew how to evacuate. So you knew you were going to be safe. That would take a lot of the fear out of wildfire. And then when a fire does get into an area, you could actually just view it as a good thing. Because if you're not in danger, and hopefully your house isn't in danger either, then the fire could just be doing a net benefit for the community because it would be doing that fire clearing for you. It would be clearing out the fuels around your community for you. And that could be viewed as a good thing. So just like how the giant sequoia likes when a fire comes through and clears out some of the fuels that compete with it for resources and make it and can lead to such an extreme fire that it overwhelms the giant sequoia's natural defenses, and then that can actually destroy the giant sequoia, it's the exact same thing with humans. And if we were really living with fire, we actually would like when fire comes through, clears out some of the fuels, so that there's less of a risk that the fuels would accumulate so much that a fire would pop up that would overwhelm our natural defenses. Or not our natural defenses, but the defenses that we put in place. So a big part of that as well is continuing to have those defenses in place and using them when we do see a community is at risk. Obviously, we don't want to just let wildfire go crazy and do its thing. But we can pick and choose, or hopefully we'll be able to pick and choose, what kind of wildfire we allow to continue to burn. So it's not maybe all just about prescribed burning. Maybe we get to the point as well where a fire is put on the ground, or maybe a fire starts due to lightning or something like that, and it's burning. And instead of immediately just throwing millions of dollars on it and putting it out, maybe we put it into, for example, Wharf S Fire, which is a model that's being run out of the Fire Weather Research Laboratory. And maybe we see, you know what? This fire could actually be a net benefit in the predicted burn area throughout the day today. It's going to clear out some fuels that haven't burned in 50 years. It's not a threat to the community. So, you know what? Instead of putting a bunch of retarded on it, maybe we just let it do its thing and we keep an eye on it. Or maybe it's a different situation where the lightning starts that fire and we say, you know what? This is one of those days where extreme wildfire is likely. This could get out of control very quickly. It could put the a community at risk. Let's put it out as quickly as possible. Then, obviously, you put that one out. But maybe we need to shift a little bit towards wanting to put everything out and thinking that any fire that burns is too high of a risk and changing our mindset into understanding that not allowing fire to burn is also a risk. So it's a lot easier to understand the risk right now, the risk today. Oh, there's a fire up in the forest and that's a problem, let's, let's deal with that. But what you don't feel or see or even smell is the fuels continuing to grow every single day and that creeping or growing problem of that can that's being kicked down the road. And that is also a huge risk. And in fact, that may be a larger risk than maybe that little fire that's burning today on a day that's maybe 70 degrees with three mile per hour winds. So those are all just a lot of kind of interesting ideas that I've been thinking about as I've been reading this textbook. You know, I'm interested to see what the next chapter is. Um, hey, I made it to page 100 of this textbook. And I think this is also my 50th episode. So I'm averaging about 
two pages per episode, which sounds about right when you look at how small some of this font is. But let's see, this next chapter is going to be about fire and plant interactions. So I think that's going to be fairly interesting. I, yeah, I imagine that we'll dive into some of the natural defenses that plants have. And what's cool is we as humans can see some of those natural defenses that plants have and figure out how we can mimic those defenses in our own lives to promote our goals when it comes to wildfire in California. But hopefully our overall goal is living with fire and kind of being in tune and in balance with the California ecosystem. Because just like temperature, wind, rainfall, and wildfire are part of the California ecosystem, we are as well. So yeah, it would be nice if we could get all of that in balance. So those were just some of my thoughts that I've been or thoughts and ideas that I've been trying to develop as I've been reading this textbook. If you want to learn more about wildfire as well, you can stay tuned and thanks for watching.